Good afternoon. It's Friday, and we are picking up some testimony on H232, and, and it'll be interspersed. We'll have testimony on H232, then H401, and then H232 again for this afternoon's session. And um, H232 is an act relating to promoting land and home ownership and economic opportunity. Um, H401 is an act relating to promoting racial and social equity in Vermont. And so those are two bills. Um, uh, committee, as I mentioned earlier, uh, H401, we just wanted to hear from uh, the sponsor and council, and we wanted to focus specifically on the the elements that had to do with a, um, a, com a housing issue within H401. Um, so let's get going. Let's let's get going. Today, we're going to welcome uh, right now Phil Huffman from the Nature Conservancy, and um, Phil, again, we, we just mentioned we've had you in committee, but it's been a couple of years as a member of um, VHCC um, and, and the, the conservation side of VHCB. We don't often get testimony in this in the housing committee from the conservation side, but um, I welcome you in today to talk about H232. So the microphone is yours. Thank you. Terrific. Well, thank you, Chair Stevens uh, and members of the committee. I uh, appreciate your making time to hear from me today and, uh, and thanks for everything that you're doing on behalf of Vermonters in a really difficult time. Uh, it's good to see again those of you that I know and have met before and uh, nice to meet the rest of you uh, who are new to the legislature uh, this year. Uh, <clears throat> I wish we were together in your committee room and not doing this by Zoom. I'm sure that's an understatement relative to how you all would be feeling these days, um, but anyway, uh, Hope we'll have a chance to get back to that, uh, at least by uh, the time things get going again next winter. Um, just for the record, my name is Phil Huffman. I'm the Director of Government Relations and Policy for the Nature Conservancy here in Vermont. And uh, as Chair Stevens was alluding to, I'm also one of the co-chairs of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Coalition, uh, which is the uh, collection of organizations that I think you know from both the housing and the conservation uh, community here in Vermont that uh, implement projects in collaboration with the HCB. Um, I want to be clear, I'm speaking today on behalf of TNC and not on behalf of uh, VHCC. Uh, I wanted to begin by just acknowledging a few things. Um, one is the, the timing um, today of getting a chance to talk with you on the heels of Earth Day. Uh, yesterday, which I hope you all had a chance to celebrate uh, in your own ways, and it uh, feels like a fitting moment to be speaking to this bill and the really important issues that it encompasses. And, uh, you know, as we talk about land here today, I also wanted to recognize uh, and understand that we're here uh, on the unceded ancestral lands of the Abenaki people, who were the traditional land caretakers of uh, Indochina, which includes Vermont, uh, parts of other New England states, and Quebec. Um, I also want to, <clears throat> excuse me, acknowledge the importance of the issues involved in this bill um, and other bills that are under consideration to address historic uh, inequities and systemic racism uh, in Vermont. And uh, we at TNC applaud uh, you all for giving time and thoughtful consideration to these bills. Um, and I just know I encourage you to give additional time to H273 uh, and the BIPOC voices uh, that are behind that initiative. I know you've given it some attention so far. Um, and then the last acknowledgement is just um, to note the uh, powerful testimony um, that I know you all heard uh, in recent days and weeks um, on H232 from a number of people, including Gus Seeley, Galise Gayette, Stephanie Morningstar, Chief Don Stevens, uh, Nick Richardson, uh, and I'm maybe leaving one or two out. But uh, anyway, I had a chance to listen to that testimony. I was certainly... Uh, struck by it very much and learned a lot from what uh, from what they all had to say as uh, well since um, TNC hasn't actually testified uh, before this committee before at least as far as I know um, I thought it might be helpful just to give you all a quick overview um, of who we are both uh, generally and here in Vermont um, and then I'll segue from there into the issues that are front and center uh, for H232. Uh, if you don't know uh, about the Nature Conservancy, we're now a global conservation organization, uh, one of the bigger ones actually in the world, um, working all across the U.S. Uh, in all 50 states and 
in I think somewhere upwards of 75 countries around the world uh, to advance our mission, which is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. So that very much includes human life as well as all of the native species uh, on, here on planet Earth. <laughs> uh, we're a science-based nonpartisan and solutions focused organization. Uh, we bring that approach to trying to tackle big environmental problems like climate change and the accelerating loss of biodiversity uh, to help create a state here in Vermont and a world uh, where nature and people can thrive together. We really see it as we're all in this together. It's essential that we create a future where uh, we all can thrive with all the species that we share this planet with. Um, here in Vermont and uh, beyond, we're probably maybe best known as a land trust, uh, and land protection is still a really core part of our work. Uh, but over the years, our work has also expanded uh, <clears throat> to more fully meet our mission. Uh, and we, we like to say that we're, we're not just the land trust anymore by any stretch. Um, just quickly, a couple of examples of other aspects of our work uh, includes restoring streams and rivers to a more natural function uh, to help protect our human communities downstream um, from flooding uh, and from uh, water quality problems. Uh, we're restoring iconic native species like the American elm, uh, working to create a wildlife friendly road network uh, for the benefit of both wildlife and uh, motorists. Um, and we're developing innovative approaches to securing funding for private landowners in Vermont through national carbon markets uh, to help the landowners keep their forests as forests and to slow climate change. So those are just a few examples. And in our work, partnerships um, are very commonly very central to things. And that uh, partnerships with policymakers, uh, you all and folks from uh, the administration, landowners, uh, state and federal agencies, local communities, uh, and a whole host of other non-governmental organizations like ours. Um, among our partnerships, one of our closest ones um, for uh, the last 30 plus years has been with VHCB. Um, and we partner with them on implementing land protection projects, uh, coal holding conservation easements, uh, for instance, on state lands. And I'll speak a little bit more to that in just a minute. Uh, and helping to support the uh, the statewide network of uh, land conservation organizations that are trying to advance land conservation all around the state. Um, most of our land protection work focuses on ecologically significant areas, uh, so places that uh, have and provide important habitat for sustaining Vermont's vast array of native species uh, in the face of climate change and other threats. Um, so we're um, in a we have some uh, overlap in terms of the places that we can serve with um, other organizations like the Vermont Land Trust. I know uh, Nick Richardson spoke with you about some of the focus of their work the other day. Um, we're less in the ag space um, than, than they are, although not, uh, not absent from it, that's for sure too. Um, and we've been uh, active here in Vermont for just over 60 years. So actually, we unfortunately missed an opportunity to have a big community celebration of our 60th anniversary last fall. But um, over the time that we've been active here, we've had a hand in helping to conserve more than 300,000 acres um, <clears throat> here in Vermont. Uh, most of that in collaboration with state and federal agencies who actually now own the land. So often we'll be involved in a conservation deal, uh, help to make it happen, and then hand off the ownership to uh, the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, for instance, or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or the Green Mountain National Forest. Um, in terms of the lands that we own, and this is relevant as we start looking in a moment into Section 5 of H-232, um, we actually hold uh, nearly 40,000 acres of land in fee statewide. Um, and of those about uh, almost 8,400 acres have a VHCB easement on them. Uh, and then we hold an, uh, conservation easements on uh, more than an additional 36,000 acres. Um, and of those, uh, more than 31,000 acres um, are where we have co-hold an easement with VHCB. So. Uh, that's again, just a, another layer on uh, the um, breadth of our partnership with the HCB and certain parts of it. 
Um, I wanted to shift for a minute and just talk about a, uh, <clears throat> some of TNC's um, perspective on some of the core issues related to <clears throat> historic in inequities and systemic uh, racism and whatnot um, here in Vermont and beyond. And I wanted to begin just by noting that uh, TNC has five core values that uh, the organization embraces on a global basis and uh, wherever we work. They've been in place for, uh, I think, at least 15 years. I've been with TNC here in Vermont now, 13 and a half years, and they were in place uh, before I got here. So uh, the two that I wanted to flag, two of the five are first, uh, respect for people, communities, and culture. And I'm actually going to quote uh, from these core values. Um, we believe that enduring conservation success depends on the active involvement of people and partners whose lives and livelihoods are linked to the natural systems we seek to conserve. We respect the needs, values, and traditions of local communities and cultures, and we forge relationships based on mutual benefit and trust. And then the other one I wanted to mention is uh, <clears throat> the uh, second of the five uh, is a commitment to diversity. And again, quoting from our core values, we recognize that conservation is best advanced by the leadership and contributions of people with widely diverse backgrounds, experiences, and identities. So there are, you know, uh, as those core values reflect uh, <laughs> issues related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, I think are, um, are woven in very much to our fabric as an organization. But that said, we firmly recognize that we're a part of white supremacy culture uh, here in Vermont and around the country and world uh, and have a lot of work to do ourselves to more fully embrace and integrate uh, the principles of diversity, equity, equity, inclusion, and justice into our organization and all aspects of our work uh, from global down to local here in Vermont. We're partway into that journey. Uh, we're working actively on it in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, we know we have a long way to go and we're gonna make mistakes along the way and we're committed to doing the work. Um, zeroing in uh, for a minute on <clears throat> the indigenous side of things, particularly um, TNC globally and on down uh, believes that supporting the voice, the choice, and action of indigenous peoples in conservation and natural resource management um, is critical for our lands, waters, and communities. Uh, it's a, this is a significant and growing focus of our work around the world, and we recognize that we can't achieve a world where both people and nature thrive unless everyone, including indigenous peoples, are treated justly and equitably. Here in Vermont, we're, um, I'm really uh, happy to say we're in the process of co-creating a non-commercial collections and access agreement with Chief Don Stevens, who you heard from earlier this week, um, and the Nalhegan Band of the Abenaki that's based in respect and trust. Uh, we intend for this agreement to apply to as much of our lands statewide as possible, and we hope to develop parallel ones with the other Beneke bands uh, to the extent of their interest. Uh, so again, we're hoping that these agreements will apply to uh, as many of our lands across the state of those 40, nearly 40,000 acres that I mentioned before um, as possible. There are some uh, legal deed restrictions, donor restrictions, and things like that in a few cases that may limit our ability to do that, but um, we expect that the agreements will apply very broadly. So with that just backdrop, I want to uh, shift in uh, zero in on uh, H232. And as, as I start in on it, um, I wanted to just briefly note that, um, as you heard from Gus Selig, uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago now, I guess it was, um, VHCB has done a lot through their programs and projects uh, to help address systemic inequities, um, both in home ownership and in land access for disadvantaged populations. Uh, and I know, um, that however things play out with this particular bill, um, that they're committed to doing more, uh, both directly and by helping to enable the rest of the housing and conservation uh, communities to address these really critical issues more fully. 
Uh, in terms of TNC's uh, perspective on H-232, we strongly support the bill's goals and intent of promoting land access and uh, home ownership and economic opportunity to historically marginalized Vermonters who have suffered discrimination and unequal access, including Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So we strongly support the goals and intent of this bill. Uh, more specifically, we support the findings and purposes in section one, uh, the proposed addition in section four of a new criterion expanding BIPOC access to land and home ownership uh, to VHCB's statutory priorities for allocating funds, and also the annual reporting requirements in section six on actions VHCB is taking. Uh, and progress it's making to remove structural barriers contributing to inequities in home ownership and access uh, to publicly op uh, supported open spaces. So our, our primary focus um, is on section five uh, related to VHCB conservation easements, um, which has a significant bearing on our conservation efforts um, as is partly reflected from some of what I spoke to before in terms of our uh, land holdings and whatnot. Uh, we strongly support the goal of Section 5 uh, to expand access for Vermont recognized tribes to conserve lands for traditional collections. So I want to be really clear about that. And I hope that uh, that's uh, evident and reinforced by what I said about the, uh, the agreement that we're working on with Chief Stevens uh, and, the, and the Nulhegan Band. Uh, and that that agreement um, with the Nalhegan Band and that we hope to extend to the other Abenaki tribes as well, uh, other Abenaki bands, excuse me, as well, um, would basically accomplish the same thing uh, with respect to our lands, at least, as what's envisioned in Section 5, but through a, a different and actually more encompassing mechanism for the uh, vast majority of our land statewide, not just those that are under the HCB easement. Um, so with that, uh, for us at least, a requirement um, in easement provisions would be unnecessary. Um, and I think the same might be true for the Vermont Land Trust based on the, the agreement that they've established uh, with the Abenaki as well that Nick spoke to uh, the other day. Um, we're also not sure uh, if the approach of including access requirements in VHCB easements um, is necessarily the best or the most straightforward way of accomplishing the goal, um, particularly given the complexity and the permanence of easements, uh, the evolving nature of these issues, and also how difficult easements are to amend. It's a really complex uh, process to amend an easement um, if there were changes that might be needed to be made at some point in the future. Um, so there are a couple of alternative and maybe more straightforward approaches to achieve the goals of Section 5 um, that we might offer. Um, one would be to, uh, this is again, instead of putting uh, a requirement into easement provisions for VHCB, um, instead to direct VHCB to encourage all of its uh, land conservation partners to develop similar voluntary access and collections agreements with Vermont tribes, like what we in VLT are doing. Um, or another approach uh, could be to direct the HCB and its land conservation partners uh, to provide for indigenous collections on NGO and public lands um, that are uh, have VHCB easements um, to do that through the management plans that VHCB already requires um, rather than through easement provisions. So that's just a, a more, um, a little bit more straightforward and flexible way of uh, capturing the sorts of uh, access agreements that I think we're all interested in here. Um, and then uh, just a couple last thoughts. Um, if Section 5 were to stay as it is, again, with the requirements being uh, in easements for Indigenous access uh, for uh, collections, um, we would want to clarify that, um, that that would only apply to easements on NGO and municipal and uh, state lands and not on uh, other private lands held by individual private landowners uh, conserved with VHCB easements, unless as the 
the uh, bill states the VHCB board found it appropriate for them to do. Uh, and this is a, it's a little subtle thing that just uh, caught our eyes. We were looking at the bill. It might be a question for legal counsel. Um, be happy to pursue that with them if it would be appropriate. And then the other um, point, just if section five were to stay as it is, it would be to just get clarity or confirmation that it would apply only to future easements and wouldn't be retroactive to existing easements. Um, and if it were retroactive, um, we would uh, have uh, serious concerns about that, again, because of the complexity of amending uh, easements and to try to fold that provision into existing agreements for us, let alone for other conservation partners, would take a major investment of staff and legal capacity and would hinder our ability to advance new conservation work. So those are uh, the uh, thoughts that I wanted to share with you today. Um, again, I want to thank you, Chair Stevens, and, and all of you on the committee for the time uh, and uh, your uh, thoughtful consideration of our perspective. And I'd you know, be happy to answer any questions um, if you have any now, and also uh, to engage with you all more with the bill sponsors or with Ledge Council on any of these issues, if that would be helpful. Thanks very much. Thank you, Phil. Um, just one quick question before I get to Representative Murphy. How many, well, uh, how many acres would would of your voluntary agreement encompass? So it's a uh, good question um, that I can't give you a firm answer on right now because others on our team are that out right now. But I think it's safe to say that it would be the substantial majority, you know, like the vast majority of our lands, um, which, as I mentioned before, nearly 40,000 acres own in fee um, that would be covered by the agreements. And, and again, the, the exceptions to that would be only parcels that have any uh, legal or donor restrictions on them that might in some way preclude us from doing something like that. And, and just I'm sorry, one last, just the idea of um, allowing, there's there's a thing about allowing pedestrian access and easements. That's something that would have been negotiated already in a, in a sale or a transfer of property that, that, that you have in your portfolio. But what this is also saying is that for this specific group of people, um, uh, that they would be able to gather plants or flowers or what have you on their land for non-commercial uses um, which we've heard about their, they've used their land that they do have in the Northeast Kingdom, um, the New the Nell Hagen lands for that purpose. But um, yeah. is that something that it would be specifically restricted? If this were to go through as is, would that be, would that restrict the non-commercial use of, of plant life um, to the tribes all, alone? Um. Because we have pedestrian, anybody can have pedestrian access if it's allowed in the in the easement. That's but it's right. the it's it's the notion of saying that that person A but not person B can then pick use those those plants or natural foods for for these purposes, which is different. This is a voluntary thing you can do. I think sounds like it's more flexible. Is what you're saying? Yeah, I think that that that's right, and. Um, it, it may depend sort of um, organization to organization or easement to easement um, in terms of what the provisions are. So it's a little bit hard to generalize. That's part of why I'm hesitating a little bit. But um, in general on our lands, um, already we allow the, the um, non-commercial collection of wild edibles for individual use. Um, so there's, uh, that's generally the case, um, you know, on our lands across the state. Um, but uh, <clears throat> this provision would, um, this is focused, um, the provision in the bill is focused more explicitly on the indigenous uh, communities. And as I say, you know, the, our agreement that we're working on uh, with the Abenaki now would be, would be more encompassing. Um, in term for them uh, in terms of our lands where uh, it would be not only on the 8,300 acres or so that have VHCB easements, but it would be on the vast majority of the 40,000 acres that we hold statewide. So does, does that 
help to answer your question? Absolutely. No, thank you. Okay. Um, Representative Murphy, then Byron. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Um, Mr. Huffman, welcome. I haven't had the chance to meet you. I was over in transportation and our paths just didn't seem to cross. <laughs> um, I was just nice curious. <laughs> I was curious when you were speaking to um, a concern being the permanence of easements. And, and I guess I would flip that and suggest that that's probably why that's what's been requested is there has been um, stated more than once, at least that I've seen in, in document and heard in testimony that there is a desire for things to be made permanent rather than being just an agreement that you have to keep a watchful eye on because it, it may get shifted in the future. And um, I, I understand that if, if an easement's already been created, the, the unwieldiness of, of altering one that exists now, but I would just be curious for certainly with your statement about looking for it just to be those going forward, could you support that that would be done as easements? Uh, yeah, I, um, I think probably I, I appreciate your point um, about uh, the desire for uh, long-term clarity about all of this and, you know, to not um, run the risk of something, you know, uh, being reversed at some point along the way. Um, you know, I can't speak for other conservation organizations, um, but, uh, you know, as far as the Nature Conservancy goes, I, this is something that I think, you know, we are uh, deeply committed to as an organization here in Vermont, and it reflects where, where we're at as a more of a nationwide organization um, in terms of our uh, relationships with indigenous communities. And so I don't uh, feel like there's um, uh, much likelihood of uh, uh, the sort of voluntary uh, co-created agreement that we're developing with the Abenaki now uh, <clears throat> being, you know, reversed or going in an opposite direction. Uh, so um, again, I feel like it's, um, in, in our case, that it uh, isn't um, necessarily uh, imperative uh, to establish something through the permanence of an easement, but I can appreciate the, the concern um, that you're expressing. And, and triggered by Representative Stevens' um, question, I'm curious, did I understand you to say that currently you do allow people to access to at least certain properties for the gathering of someone finds a great mushroom lot or whatever, but just for their personal use, obviously, but that, that is something you permit currently to any individual? We do, generally. Well, so, so my follow-up on that would be, would this actually limit, because this is speaking strictly to people of the Vermont recognized tribes, you have to be a member of Vermont recognized tribes. So this almost sounds like it would be, you'd have to pull back on your other opportunity. I, I wouldn't see it as, as being in conflict. Um, okay. It would be just more um, explicit uh, and uh, to the, uh, you know, to the indigenous communities. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, Representative Byron, then Toronto. Thank you, Chair. Phil, good to see you again. It's been a while. Likewise. Uh, yeah. So I think a, a chunk of my questions have been answered already in regards to the access to land for um, obviously seasonally appropriate, like hunting, fishing, then foraging and whatnot. Um, now, how about like land access if the individuals want to spend a couple of days there? Are they allowed to overnight? Obviously not creating permanent structures, of course, but is that allowed as part of the land access? Uh, on our lands? Yeah, just asking specifically to your organization. Yeah. In TNC, yeah. So we don't allow overnight uh, camping on our lands, uh, the, the lands that we hold in fee um, at this point. And I don't, I'm not aware if that's been uh, something that's come up in the, um, the uh, sort of work in progress development of the act document that, that I've touched on that we're working on with the Abenaki. Okay. Um, okay, cool. And then I guess my other question is um, you, you, you deal with so many different parcels. So back to sort of the easement rabbit hole. Um, 
do you often, I mean, I know your organization tries to keep the construct of the easement similar, but do you ever run into the situation where you would have aggregated parcels that have different rules and regs as to usership? I know we were kind of touching on that before, but it was a lot of information to digest at once. Yeah, so uh, if we want to go uh, much deeper on this, I might uh, want to uh, bring in uh, some of my colleagues from our team uh, who are on the front lines of our stewardship work and, and, and management of our lands on a day-to-day -day basis and who are uh, implementing the terms of uh, easements and other uh, legal restrictions that we have uh, related to our lands and whatnot uh, to answer that. But I mean, I think um, a sort of high level answer is that there are different provisions for different parcels depending. Um, and uh, so uh, there may be some differences in terms of the, um, you know, the, the legal uh, parameters or constraints. In the, um, it, it, yeah. Yeah, and I'm just curious because of the whole concept, you know, you got two large parcels that are abutting, you know, they kind of like act as one in one theory, but you, somebody crosses a brook and then all of a sudden they're not allowed to do X, Y, and Z when they could do it on that side. I just wanted to see if, as the conversation evolves, just dig into that a little bit, so. Yeah, no, I think it's it, it's a it's a really uh, good question. Um, and I think it's, uh, safe to say, and uh, maybe I would, uh, you know, uh, stand to be corrected by my colleagues, but um, that in general, uh, I don't feel like that is in that is the case typically for our lands in terms of the public access that we allow, or uh, you know, as you were alluding to, uh, we allow hunting and fishing on almost all of our lands statewide. It's only if there's a again a, some sort of legal restriction or a donor restriction um, yeah. it's it's limited. Uh, that where that's the case. So um, I feel like there, you know, generally there aren't those sorts of um, uh, differences in terms of management policies or what's allowed, you know, sort of place to place within a, um, you know, within uh, adjoining parcels uh, that are yep. under our ownership. Yeah, no, no. I mean, you, you, you know, I'm a huge fan of getting more of these adjoining parcels to create, create larger land mass for these, these conservation efforts. Um, you know, I just, with some of the other work that we've discussed and some of the other work that I've done outside of the legislature, you run into those problems, especially when you're dealing with private ownership sometimes where people are, yeah. Right. We both know what each other are saying, but all right, that's all I got. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure thing. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just sure. maybe I'll just add one sort of footnote to that, which is I think it, in terms of lands that we own, it's a um, it's a much different situation um, in terms of it, again like a, a more consistent um, policies across lands that we own that may be in different parcels but adjacent to each other than is the case between um, neighboring private lands or between public lands and private lands that may or may not be posted, things like that. So sort of a different situation in terms of within our lands. Hope that's helpful. All right, Representative Trial. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Good to see you, Phil. I think we've uh, sat at a lunch table and had some conversations in the past. Uh, so yeah. I, I miss that and look forward to getting back to it. Me too. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I agree. So um, I'm just asking for, you know, the, the notion that you might have uh, from your perspective is non-commercial use of medicine. Would that include growing cannabis? Hmm. Uh, that's an interesting question um, <laughs> uh, that had not crossed my mind before, I'll uh, confess. Um, I think in the case of our lands or the way that I would interpret this um, provision of the bill that um, the, the collections are for, would be for things that are occurring naturally on the landscape um, and not something that would be cultivated. That makes sense. Uh, so yeah, that, uh, I'm trying to think if there's any. Um, I, I can't. I can't envision a, a scenario different from that it's with respect to our lands, at least. Okay. I appreciate that, and that, you know, I, I kind of zeroed in on the carve out for excluding uh, 
or uh, uh, but not including standing timber. Um, back in the mid 70s, I worked for Community Action and um, on occasion, I was assigned uh, to a project that uh, some uh, indigenous um, tribes from Maine came over and they built their lodges out of cedar that was thin enough to bend into hoop shape. And uh, I took them down to Bradford on a uh, underwater cedar lot and we spent the day cutting cedar whips for their lodging. So I guess I'm curious, uh, Chief Stevens mentioned they have 65 acres of land uh, from his band and um, the notion that they may have a need or a want to uh, construct a, an indigenous or, or native village um, and uh, wondering if that would be prohibited uh, in your interpretation. Uh Well, I'm not a lawyer. I'll start with that. Um, <laughs> so I would defer to others who are for a legal interpretation. Um, but uh, I guess um, based on the uh, just sort of a straightforward reading of the language in the bill, um, uh, it seems like something like that might be precluded, um, you know, that, that something like that could fall under timber harvest. Um, yeah. Again, depending upon how one interprets uh, that term, I suppose as well. But um, yeah. All right. Sorry to give you the hard ones, though. But <laughs> <laughs> the way I'm thinking today, <laughs> they're they're all fair game. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. All right. No, thank you so much for coming in, Phil. Um, it's very helpful. To, I mean, you know, there's always, you know, understanding the balance between um, what we can do legislatively, which is not to say we're not going to do anything legislatively on this, but that, you know, that simply freeing up or allowing there to be to start just with TNC or just with a, you know, 40,000 acres is would be a substantial increase over what exists right now. So, um, you know, thank you. Appreciate the explanation. And, um, we're gonna we're gonna check in with another witness now, but I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And you know, I might just add one more point that I realized I neglected to say before in terms of the the um, extent of our uh, ownership. That I I believe we're the second largest private landowner in Vermont right now, and so there we are talking about a substantial amount of acreage that um, we look forward to uh, having these sorts of agreements with the Abenaki peoples on. Um, so again, regardless of where things go with this bill. So, but um, thank you <clears throat> again for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I appreciate your time and your good questions um, and feel free to let me know if uh, there's anything more that I can provide by way of information or um, for dialogue around uh, the provisions of the bill as it goes forward. Great, thank you. Thanks much. All right, committee, I see that uh, Representative Colburn has joined us and um, we're gonna switch gears to H401. Um, welcome, Representative Colburn. Um, you are one of the three co-sponsors, I believe, as the head of um, your respective party. And here comes Representative McCoy as well. Um, I'm gonna hold my breath for a second. Representative McCoy, welcome. Um, and we're here to um, get a, a, a quick introduction to the bill. Uh, and the reason is and we hadn't taken it off because it had been um, it had come in late. Um, but we I just want to get a quick background on the bill and and really, I guess, a focus on Section three. Um, as part of, as part, you know, it, it, I think the details we're interested in are in section three, but I just want, you know, if you could just give us an overview and I'll, I'll let you flip a coin to see who's, who goes first. Um, and, and just explain to us why 401 came to us and um, what, you know, what we should make of it. And, and again, to, then to focus on, on section three, because it has the, it's, which is the section on, um, Putting a working group together to, to discuss how do we extend credit when without a credit report, kind of, um, mm -hmm. um, which is an interesting question when it comes to our housing 
issues. So, um, okay, so um, I am going to give the brief overviews on the first two sections, and then Representative Colburn will give the uh, overviews on which will be section three and four. But uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. For the record, Representative Patty McCoy. I'm here with uh, Representative Celine Coburn, and thank you for allowing us to come uh, before your committee this afternoon to give a brief overview of this bill. Uh, this is a tripartisan bill that came through the three leaders, uh, Representative Long, Representative uh, Coburn, and myself, uh, put the, this bill together um, with uh, speaking with uh, President Pro Tem, and administration. And this is the bill that kind of uh, came together with all of those um, individuals. The bill is broken down, as I said, into four sections, all of which we believe are worthy of moving forward. Uh, we do realize it's rather late in the session and appreciate the opportunity to give this overview on the various sections of this bill of which some uh, obviously may need to uh, take pass throughs other committee through other committees. And I'm not sure we are not the ones that decide where this bill starts, but you are the chosen one. No. Uh, we're hopeful we can work uh, through this bill um, with an eye towards passage uh, next session. I'll give an overview, as I said, of the first two sections, the first of which is education. And this uh, proposes to develop and maintain a model curriculum for elementary and secondary schools to teach against hate speech and hateful imagery and symbols. The curriculum should include best practices for teaching these concepts. We ask the Secretary of, Edu Ed of Education to provide the training on the model curriculum and best practices, provide teaching materials necessary to reach students at the appropriate age levels, and provide technical assistance to the districts in implementing this curriculum. The superintendents will determine the content, duration, and frequency of these trainings on the issues of hate speech, hateful imagery, and symbols. Uh, we are also asking the Ethnic and Social Equity Standards Advisory Working Group to advise the Secretary of Education on developing the model curriculum, as well as a model racial equity policy. We're adding an additional section in the statute under the powers and duties of school boards. Sorry, Representative Hango, here is another school board mandate. Uh, to include an additional duty of school boards to develop and implement a racial equity policy to be as stringent as the model policy to be developed by the Sec Secretary of Education in collaboration with the Ethnic and Social Equity Standards Advisory Working Group, and they shall publish uh, this model policy, which the school boards may choose to adopt. The bill also further creates a task force on, social, on school exclusionary policies with regard to suspensions and expulsions. However, this section has been dealt with in S16 and is currently in our House Appropriations Committee. The employment section deals with unlawful employment practices. And I believe you may have two bills in your committee that might deal with some of these issues, uh, H320 and H329 that address this issue. I'm unsure if you've taken testimony on these or not. So I will just briefly go through um, some of it. Uh, those who have been here in the uh, legislature a few years uh, may recall legislation we passed a few years ago uh, known as the Do Not Darken My Doorstep regarding sexual harassment claims. Uh, rather than reinventing the wheel, the proposed language in this bill mirrors the language in that sexual harassment claims bill. The following bullet points reference Title 21, Section 495, and provide that uh, shall be unlawful employment practice to discharge an employee because the employee lodged a complaint, testified or participated in any manner or investigation being carried out by the attorney general, state's attorney, Department of Labor or any other state investigation agency listed in the proposed bill. The employer knows the employee is about to lodge a complaint or testify. 
disclosed the employee's wages or inquired or discussed employee's wages with other employees. And an employer cannot require an employee to sign an agreement or waiver of either of the, uh, number one, any of the above mentioned actions or make the employee waive any procedural rights or remedies with respect to a claim of a violation of the above mentioned um, provisions. An agreement to settle a claim with regard to this section shall not prevent the employee from working for the employer or a, a subdivision or an affiliate, et cetera, of the employer. I will now yield to Representative Colburn to speak on the remainder of the proposed bill. Thank you. That was, that was so um, thorough. That's a tough act to follow, Representative McCoy. Um, just to give a little more background about just the genesis of this bill um, or origin story of the bill, um, the, the really these recommendations um, grew out of the racial equity task force that the governor put together in 2020 um, that had a kind of a wide range of membership. And they brought some recommendations to the House and Senate leadership teams um, in a variety of subjects. And um, we thought there was a lot of merit to the intent and what they were trying to get at and brought this forward. But just you know, want to be really clear, I think we felt like, great, let's bring it forward, but it, it needs to go through the legislative process. And um, so we're not necessarily advocating this is the exact right way to do it, but wanted to make sure that the administration's recommendations here, you know, got in, got in front of the right committees through the process. So I'm going to talk about um, the housing and judiciary sections. The housing section, um, as, as Chair Stevens noted, creates a working group to examine options for allowing landlords and housing lenders to accept alternative documentation to demonstrate financial soundness. And the issue that's really trying to be addressed here is just um, what in the language of um, the task forces, they brought the, these recommendations to us. The huge disparities in our economy that affect um, people in communities of color. So they talked about um, how the, the compounded discrimination and opportunity gaps is the language that they used in our, um, in our economy and our, and our systems of establishing credit. So an example, a prime example of that might be that um, communities of color are perhaps more subject to predatory lending practices Practices, which we know, you know, then have disproportionate impacts and affect people's ability to build um, strong credit scores. We certainly saw that in um, some of the housing lending that um, has happened in recent decades. So the the hope, he, the thought here is that other criteria such as timeliness of rent payments um, and other indicators may be um, more or equally valuable in establishing someone's financial soundness than simply just like a credit card history or, or rating. Um, and so the idea is to, to bring this group of stakeholders together and you have the bill, so I'm not gonna go through and read um, each individual person. And I think it would be great to have input from your committee about whether this is in fact the right group of people to weigh in on this question. Um, but would come together and make some recommendations about alternative forms of documentation that could be used to uh, establish financial soundness and report back to the legislature by October 15th of this year. So maybe I'll pause and see if there are questions about that section, since I know it's of particular interest to you. Representative Kalaki. Thank you, Chair, and, and welcome. Uh, Celine and Patty, very much appreciate you're here. Um, I, I, this, this alternate credit thing is interesting to me. Do banks have a, um, a kind of fixed criteria or does every, can every bank 
make their own credit determination? I, I don't know. My sense just from my own experience is that it's a little of both, to be honest, but I am not, this is not my policy area and, um, you know, I'm not, so I would really encourage, I think if you're going to take this bill up, I would really encourage you to um, bring in members of the task force who made these recommendations, who can really sure. do a deep dive on the research they already did to inform yes. this, but okay. I think, I think, I think it's a little of both. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I thank you for punting the list back to us. We were hoping that you would might give us more specific um, folks um, on the on the list of what the working group, the thing that we've learned this year is that, um, um, and we've known it, but I think it was made, it's been really clear in all the work that's being done in a lot of the committees is, is making sure that the people in the room are the right people um, to have this conversation and not just, um, not just, um, and in this particular case, not just DFR and not just the bankers, but the, you know, affected community, people who are, people who have experienced um, the lack of, of ability, a lack of access to um, credit in this case um, for whatever reasons. So we will continue to look for that. If we, if we move forward with this section, we'll continue to look for the, that list of people. Yeah, and the, I, I, I did just take a look at who was actually on the racial equity task force and um, just so you have a sense of where, you know, who was in the room developing these recommendations. It was the executive director of racial equity, so Susanna Davis, a member, Brittany Wilson, um, representing the governor's office, Chris Raquel representing law enforcement. Um, I think there were some other public members who may not be named in the list I'm looking at. Um, Tabitha Palmore from the NAACP, Carol, McGranahan from the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs, um, the executive director of ACLU and the executive director of the Human Rights Commission. So it was a it was a broad range of folks, but but not necessarily folks with a ton of financial expertise. Um, and that might be kind of why, in some ways, their task force recommendations tilt that way. But um, yeah, I would encourage you all to think about. Um, you know, how to get as many impacted voices in the conversation as possible. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Chair Stevens. I would just um, add that I think that might be a bit of the point of making this a working group, that um, looking at how this can be done in a different manner, as opposed to they, they have options and they just haven't chosen to take access. And, um, with a little bit of back history of being um, having family connection to banking would just suggest that the biggest criteria is that there be some fiduciary aspect that does give some kind of security. And so, you know, looking at the history of never having a late payment on your rent or, you know, just something that would balance. I, I think that quite often we look for, for what's easy and convenient and the credit ratings have become that type of process for an organization to be able to just pay a fee to be a member and have that checked off the book. So just a thought. I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think that's exactly what this, the recommendation is trying to get at. I think that's exactly right. Would you like me to just do a quick summary of the judiciary um, sure. recommendations yep. as well or? Yep. Great. Um, so, the first is um, really relates to booking photographs. So when someone has been arrested and charged and it's, you know, the documentation is happening and they're being photographed um, in a police station. Uh, I think it came to the attention of this group that a number of police agencies were requiring that folks wearing religious headwear remove it for those photographs. And so, and the, I, had the sense that that was there was some concern um 
from the task force about that. And so this is um, asking the criminal justice council and the racial equity director. So not standing up a new group, but just asking existing groups to really look at this issue and essentially create a uniform statewide policy on this that would come forward and then um, directs the joint legislative oversight committee if they are going to take legislative action on it to do so by December 1st and then have legislation ready for the 2022 session. So that's one piece. Um, and then the remainder of um, the recommendations from the group really concern the ju judicial nominating board and process. Um, so there is a judicial, as the folks know, probably know, there's a judici judicial nominating board with um, a range of appointees that makes recommendations to the, to the governor who then essentially moves forward the slate of folks who become judges. And then there's a separate process that we went through this year and a separate committee um, that's a joint legislative committee on retention of judges. So this, we're talking really about the nominating process here, the process of deciding who, um, putting forward a slate of folks for the governor to consider as potential new judges. Um, so there is a proposal, and I just wanna be really clear that this is really a proposal from the administration. I think this is an example of one that folks had some questions about, but felt like, okay, well, let's move it forward and it can go through the legislative process. But this would reduce the um, current membership, which is 11 on the judicial nominating board to nine. So it removes one house appointee, one Senate appointee, and the a Supreme Court appointee of a lawyer. Um, so that's a reduction of three folks and then adds the racial justice director to the judicial no nominating board. So I think there was, uh, I, I mean, we all sort of took this to our caucuses for some feedback and then came back and really decided, well, let's just move it forward and let it go through the process. But I know that in some quarters, there were definitely some questions about this one. And just because it does kind of tilt the balance um, of the judicial nominating board more to the executive branch. Um, and I, I believe maybe the social equity caucus had some questions about just the, these precise recommendations as well, but um, there was a lot of support for the idea of trying to make the nominating process and composition of the board um, more open and reflective of concerns around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, the nominating process itself, um, there are some recommendations that are made for criteria on, on judicial nominatings here. There's a simple change in language that changes um, language that says someone must be well qualified to qualified. Um, currently there's a requirement that someone has to have practiced law in Vermont for five years to be nominated. This proposal changes that to two years. And then in a similar vein, re just removes the word Vermont from rules of evidence. So it just says someone has to be familiar with the rules of evidence um, with the idea that some of those skills will be transferable from state to state. Um, and those recommendations really are about creating the possibility that there could be more um, candidates put forward, that folks who are a little newer to Vermont but still qualified could be put forward, and that younger candidates who might be a little earlier in their career could also be considered. So it's an, it is an attempt to think about how some small shifts in the qualifications could potentially diversify the bench in Vermont. Um, and then the um, second sort of category of change here is that currently the judicial nominating board, mm, there's some explicit um, direction that they may not consider race or ethnicity and that really exists to prevent discrimination. It's very well intentioned, but um, the judiciary, the Vermont Bar Association and the legal community have all expressed the desire to actually be able to be more thoughtful about 
expanding that diversity, equity, inclusion lens in their work and, and feel that um, like this might actually be have a dampening effect on that. And so you'll see that there's some explicit pro proactive language here about drawing candidates from diverse backgrounds to represent um, ethnic communities and communities of color in Vermont. And that's really the final um, change that's proposed here. And like I said, I think this whole section is a good example of one. And maybe it's just because, you know, I'm on the Judicial Retention Committee and the Judiciary Committee. So this is stuff that I spend some time with. But, um, you know, I think this is a good example of like the, the intentions I really agree with and whether these are the exact right legislative proposals, I think warrants a lot more work through the legislative process and committee process. Um, but I think the intentions are really solid here to, to really think about how we can diversify the, our, the bench in Vermont. Great, thank you. Um, any questions for Selena on, on these two sections or on this last section, Representative Kalaki? I just, uh, I wanna say I appreciate this bill in that it came from you know, the, the racial equity task force from the governor, it came to the three heads of the leadership of the party and it, it's a combined piece. It's, it's holistic that way. And it, it uh, you know, it will go through many committees, but I think this is a, a model of, of wonderful kind of work and conversation for all of us. So I want to thank both of you and for bringing this forward to us. I appreciate it. Welcome. Well, I I appreciate that and I'll, oh, it's Brian Pine. I appreciate that and I will um, just say, you know, I think one of the things when we were talking about this in our leadership group was to know that it was really important. We felt it was really important to bring these recommendations forward and also really important to note that, you know, this isn't meant to be some kind of comprehensive racial justice package at all, um, at, that there's clearly other work that the racial equity task force is doing, that the administration is doing, that we are doing in all of our committees to advance this work. So these were the kind of, I think, the low hanging fruit that this task force perceived that we felt like, yes, let's move it forward, but it not meant to be the racial, justice package, it's really important that we see this as just one piece in a, in a much broader set of um, commitments as policymakers. No, but the, 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 just the fact that it was, a, that it was um, presented in the way that it was, it is somewhat of an endorsement of these policies at some levels, which is really you know, a nice indication. Sometimes when we got Representative McCoy, when we got H320 and H329, we were familiar with the do not darken my door stuff. It got caught up in COVID last year. We, you know, it should have been a simple thing to pass, but we also weren't aware of, of, of where there may have been support for it. And so moving forward, we know now that there is, at least on the surface level, some support for this in a broad way, which is, which is really nice to know moving forward. Um, two quick, two questions, and then I wanna go to, um, uh, I wanna move back to 232 and let, let, the, uh, let Representative Colburn and McCoy get back to work. Um, the Representative Bloomley, then Triano. Yeah, thank you, um, Chair, and and thank you, <clears throat> Representatives, for coming here today. I, I actually, I, I was so intrigued by this bill when I read it a while ago, um, it, when it was um, assigned to the committee, because I actually think that um, that the points that um, uh, Representative Clacky and Stevens made is is really important. That like, um, oftentimes change needs to. Ha I mean, it's it's. It's kind of it's it's weaving things into the fabric, you know, that that ultimately makes the difference um, overall. It isn't one big bill. It isn't you know um, necessarily splashy. These are, but the these uh, these seem to be very. Um, uh, anyway, I, I just I I appreciate I appreciate what's in here and the process. So thank you very much. Representative Trana. Yes, um, thanks for coming in, uh, 
Patty and Celine, good to see you both again. Uh, well, sort of, but uh, <laughs> Patty and I sat across from each other. I don't know, right? Yeah. <laughs> for human services. But, you know, I'm really um, um, encouraged to see the first part of this bill of surrounding debate speech. Um, I sit on the um, uh, racial equity, the uh, equity uh, council um, in the Hardwick area here. And we're just kind of starting up. We've been going for, you know, six or eight months now. And we're still trying to kind of divide, define our, our mission. But, um, you know, we're hearing um, in our schools that there certainly uh, uh, is, uh, are, are some issues surrounding this. And as, uh, as you and I, Patty, know uh, from uh, childhood trauma in uh, human services days, that childhood trauma is best dealt with at an early age. So the notion of, um, of beginning this in elementary school uh, will hopefully make some inroads uh, to, um, a, you know, to uh, correct some of these uh, notions and uh, and some of these uh, issues that become behavioral issues uh, later on. And uh, many times there are, uh, you know, family. Uh, it's a family thing that um, you know young young people relate that. No, they don't want to get their uh, parents uh, angry for um, you know accepting people of color. Um, so I think. The earlier that we can launch this, the better we are. And I'm encouraged to see this part of the bill in particular that uh, will hope to address some of these issues that we're finding routinely in our schools right now. So thanks very much. I appreciate it from uh, all of you. Thank all you right. for having us. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to the work of the Racial Equity Task Force and in, in really shaping these records. Yep. No, I, and, and I think it was very useful, again, to put these in a package to just sort of refer to. I do think that if we, you know, if, if we do end up working with a section on, on credit, you know, it leaves the bill open to be transferred to the next committee, you know, or the next committee if there's an interest in picking up um, the recommendations, whether it's, I, I mean, it is late in the year, but even if it's early next year, um, we'll certainly uh, want to get the bill to the to the right place where people can peel off the sections or, you know, or the next, if it's next year, perhaps people will introduce separate bills um, to get them into the right committees. But thank you so much for coming in and, and talking to us about it. Good to see you both. Have a great weekend, everybody. Yeah, Take, you care. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Rumi. Bye. <laughs> All right, and we're going to, in lieu of a break, we're going to pop right over to Brian Pine, who is here to talk about um, H-232. And Brian, this is, I believe, the first time that you've been in general housing and military affairs, and I'm sorry to do this to you as the new Earhart. Um, so if you can just let us know, you know, where you are, how you, how you are not the new Earhart, how you are, Brian Prime, you have an incredibly long history in working in housing in, in Burlington, and you bring a load of experience to this role that you're in now. And I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm appreciative that you picked up the, the, the baton for the time being at the least, um, but welcome. Uh, the microphone's yours. Thank you, Chair Stevens. The, uh... The shoes I'm trying to fill, I kind of equate it to um, uh, my older brother who wore a size 12, and I, I've never worn a size 12, but um, I, <laughs> I am serving in this role for at least a few months uh, to help the coalition uh, with the transition from Earhart's nearly 25 years of service uh, onto his new role uh, with Senator Sanders, and um, I am uh, greatly appreciative of the work that your committee does, and uh, I haven't been before this iteration of this committee, but I'm a little long in the tooth, as they say. So I've been before other versions of this committee in the past. And uh, um, I am really impressed with the work you've been doing. And the focus on housing has been uh, at a time when we need it more than ever. So thank you for, for all of your work. Uh, what uh, Representative Bloomley asked me to speak on today was uh, primarily on the on the Bill H-232. Uh, I will touch on that in my comments, uh, but I want to just give some sort of um, um, comments that, that help to sort of put this in the context of where we are, and I hope you'll bear with me. I'll try not to go on as long as, um, as uh, Gus Selig did last week or a couple weeks ago, but um, 
Uh, Gus is an old friend. And I joked with him and said, if I can get in five minutes to say what you said in 45 minutes, maybe that will be a good thing. Um, but I think it's clear that uh, the importance of housing has become more clear during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has really laid bare our longstanding systemic deficiencies and inequalities, not just in Vermont, but really as a, as a society. Um, COVID has made the unseen scene, and we've known for years that housing is is critical and is, is a form of health care, really, and that housing is indeed really like a vaccine in a way. Uh, no one can stay safe at home unless they have a home to stay safe in, right? So as more and more people work at home and the whole nature of housing and what it delivers has changed because of COVID, uh, we have to look for ways to ensure housing security and stability for folks who've, who've often been uh, left behind. And viewed through an equity lens, Vermont has really been a national leader. And this committee is at the forefront of our state's efforts, I believe, in making the strategic investments that lie at that nexus of, of housing and health. And I would say proudly as, as one of the people who was there when VHCB was started, VHCB has been at the forefront of this work. Um, and uh, really housing investments have been at the forefront of Vermont's pandemic response over the last uh, 14 months, thanks in large part to the unprecedented investment of federal CARES Act funding. With coronavirus relief funds extended uh, into this year and the new federal relief from ARPA now on the way, um, our highest priority must be to continue housing programs that keep low income and vulnerable Vermonters and those with special needs safe during the pandemic and beyond. The governor and the legislature have maintained the focus on housing that is essential to protecting the most vulnerable Vermonters. Uh, our legislative priorities at the Affordable Housing Coalition were formed in January of this year, and they include this following broad statement, which I'll just share with you. Uh, historically, government policies to acquire land and secure housing have intentionally prevented Black, Indigenous, and people of color from full participation and have limited their wealth creation. We must act now to understand and address the systemic inequity. Targeted housing investments can help bring, can help right longstanding racial injustice. So that's our, our statement as a coalition um, on this issue. Now, with respect to, to H232, and, and I think I, I just want to mention H273, which the committee took testimony on earlier this week, the BIPOC land access bill. The coalition's legislative priorities were clearly established before either of these bills were introduced. Um, our members have not weighed in either uh, as individual organizations or nor as a coalition as our steering committee taken a position on either of these bills. But I can affirm that our coalition, the Affordable Housing Coalition, supports the goals of the bills and supports a keen focus on meeting BIPOC housing needs with respect to both VHCB policies and really all state funded housing efforts. Um, so I just wanna uh, to share that at, at the start. Um, while, we're, while we're not prepared to speak to the specifics uh, of the proposed changes to the composition of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, board, as redundant as that sounds at this time, we do wanna thank the governor for recently appointing Clarence Davis to the board. I personally worked very closely with Clarence when he was first elected as Burlington's second African-American city councilor in 2006. He worked for both Downstreet and VHFA and served as acting, acting deputy secretary of AHS and, and presently works with the Vermont Health Network. Clarence will bring a valuable perspective to, this, to the board and I just wanna recognize and acknowledge that. Uh, you may know that our coalition consists of over 90 organizations or members with some of those being individuals, but we cover every corner of the state. Many of our members were founded, literally in, in part founded to address the systemic racism and discrimination embedded in America's housing market and housing policies of our government. The history of housing discrimination, redlining and racist federal housing policies has created a disproportionate wealth gap for land and home ownership. The Great Recession of 2008 resulted in the largest single loss of Black family wealth in the history of this country. 
Let me just say that again. The 2008 recession resulted in the largest loss of black family wealth in the history of this country. Vermont was not spared uh, that tragedy. Federal policies failed to adequately regulate lenders uh, that helped to bring about this massive loss of family wealth. And the last economic recovery really failed to restore black family wealth to pre-recession levels. Home ownership is the main source of family wealth in America. We know that, that's a fact. And, and many families lost that, that grasp on, on some part of the American dream. Um, in a 2019 report by the Economic Policy Institute, they said that essentially structural barriers, including the criteria by which homes are financed and discrimination in lending and housing markets, along with low levels of initial wealth were, were reported as playing an increased and racially uneven role in the manner in which Americans are acquiring homes. So for lower income black households, racial disparities in home ownership are at an all time high nationally. And that is also true in Vermont. As you heard from Dr. Seguino's testimony earlier this week, these disparities are equally pronounced here in, in the Green Mountain State. Um, our coalition members are really on the front lines in the struggle to uh, provide housing, but also to prevent the gentrification and involuntary displacement of low income and BIPOC Vermonters and to force, foster opportunities for creating housing stability and building family wealth. Our coalition members use the Vermont Housing Conservation Board uh, to bridge the affordability gap in both rental housing and in home ownership. When a family, and this may be obvious to everybody, I think it's just important to state, when a family has affordable housing, they're able to set aside funds for things like down payments and maybe repair credit issues that are needed to help them qualify for a mortgage and generally help them keep their finances in order to retain their homes over the long haul. Although we fully acknowledge that there's an imperative role to take more intentional and strategic measures to reverse the harmful effects of the legacy of racism in our housing market, Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition members with VHCB support across our state are providing housing to a population that more closely reflects the racial compositions of the communities that we serve. In fact, one of our largest coalition members and a, a, a longstanding grantee of the VHCB reports that 37% of the renter households and 14% of the homeowners served by this organization are non-white. So 37% of their renters, 14% of their homeowners. Legion to be begs the question, what's the gap there? Why is that so different? And that, that these data really illustrate one of our most challenging uh, aspects of uh, rates of homeownership. And that is that persistently lower household incomes, lack of access to decent jobs, lack of family wealth have kept BIPOC families from, from enjoying the benefits of, of home ownership and the wealth building that comes from that. Uh, we feel that these impediments require both more resources and a renewed and redoubled commitment to specific actions to eliminate racial disparities in housing. Specifically, the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition supports the following steps, and these are specific steps that uh, we believe uh, can be taken in this, uh, in this, in this bill. Directing VHCB and other agencies in statute to conduct comprehensive assessments of policies, programs, and operations, and report to the legislature on actions taken or needed to eliminate race-based barriers, increase inclusive, inclusivity, and access to housing. Adding access to land and homes by BIPOC individuals, households, and communities to VHCB's funding, I'm sorry, allocation priorities in the authorizing statute which is 15 VSA section 322. Expanded funding to support capacity grants and technical assistance to BIPOC organizations. And lastly, expanded funding to VHCB for outreach and grants for the development of affordable shared equity homes and grants for BIPOC households to purchase homes. And just to recap uh, our thoughts and our input on H232, we think adding expanded BIPOC, BIPOC access to homes and land to VHCB's allocation priorities is perhaps the single most effective thing that you can do. We also appreciate the directive to explicitly address both the board's work and the efforts of VHCB's partners, our members, on removing racial disparities in the VHCB annual report. So an actual reporting in the report on what we're doing, what are the outcomes, not just what are the efforts, but what are the outcomes. 
We remain open to changes in the composition of the BH VHCB board, but at the very least feel that adding experience, direct experience in social and racial equity policy ought to be a factor in appointments going forward. Thank you for your focus on addressing the role of housing and uprooting systemic racism. We are facing an historic opportunity to rebuild our economy and our state in ways that ensure full participation by all members of our communities and your continued efforts are greatly appreciated. Thank you, Brian. Um, questions for Brian? The, um, the elements of the work ahead of us, um, uh, the irony is not lost that, um, you know, that we've gone from a, a mode for the years, at least that, that the coalition has been in existence of almost begging for money to deal with these situations to um, all of a sudden having this opportunity. And I am personally worried that, you know, no matter what, we're gonna miss something somewhere along the way and, and um, maybe treat it as a Band-Aid as opposed to a systemic change, which is I think the demands that are being asked of us in, in different areas of, of our work. And I'm just wondering, you know, with, with your experience in the field and, and with the ideas that are being put forward, um, there's a lot of speed. And again, what I'm, what I'm fearful is, is missing something, is, is missing the opportunity to do that systemic work. And I'm wondering, you know, based on, and I guess this is speaking maybe out of, out of turn from the organization and more about your experience, but just in terms of we're moving so quickly what can we do? <laughs> what are the what are the speed bumps we can put in to make sure that we're we're either making sure that the people who are doing the work are doing it correctly or that we're doing it correctly so that we do build systemic change and not just and not just band-aids, very expensive in a lot of them, but you know, essentially what are band-aids, what could be band-aids if if not treated correctly? Sure. I think the um the this, this, this saying or the motto that I, I like to, to call up uh, from a friend of mine who sadly has struggled in the Vermont uh, mental health system her whole life. And she's um, she one who often reminds me, nothing about me without me is what she says. And, and what is really important here is when we talk about providing a leg up or an opportunity to get part of that American dream in Vermont for BIPOC folks, it ought to be, they ought to be at the center of that conversation. And I think it's really important for us as, as, as white Vermonters to recognize that we don't have necessarily the answers and there ought to be recognition that the collective knowledge of, of BIPOC communities in Vermont should be very much at the center of that, of that conversation. So I just wanna put that out there. Um, but also just say that I think one thing Vermont has managed to do uh, with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board is to be to have the guiding principles that really underpin the way we allocate dollars and to ensure that we don't just, even as tempting as it is, make a one-time allocation of state public dollars and not ensure that that benefit stays and accrues to future households down the, down the road. And that's the whole notion of perpetual affordability, which is embedded in, in Vermont policy, which can be controversial uh, as we discuss this issue of access to families who've been left behind, um, there's some debate that'll be had there around that issue because the feeling is, well, wait, you've got a form of home ownership that most of us enjoy, but you're telling us we got to do something different here. And I think it's important to really be grounded in the notion that the whole idea of, of, of ensuring the public subsidy gets protected is that the next family or the heirs of the people who got the initial benefit are able to be helped in the future. And we don't have to uh, watch the public subsidy become a windfall to someone who got lucky enough to essentially win the lottery in housing when they got the assistance. We want that benefit to be there, an enduring, durable benefit, much like we have things like infrastructure and parks and public, public improvements that we make. We wanna think of our resources in that way, I think is, is really super critical here. No, that, that idea of, of um perpetual affordability is something that um, 
I think the committee, and if we are able to time in and get some, uh, get another housing uh, education before we leave, just to just to go through some of the vocabulary of what perpetual affordability is and why that when there wasn't any money, let's say pre twenty twenty, that this battle between using state or federal funds, state funds mostly to fund housing was all, we were always under capacity and we know that. And we put perpetual affordability on the table as saying, if you take this money, this apartment, this unit, this building has to stay affordable forever, perpetually, um, which made it hard to consider the VHIP program that we're talking about, you know, that where we're, where we're loaning or granting money to private landlords to bring units back online. Um, even this home ownership program that we're considering for S79. And I think it's important because those aren't perpetually affordable. Those will be affordable perhaps to the level of the amount of money that we're letting out. But it's an interesting, um, I, th I think this is something that we'll, again, we'll try to get the committee brought up to speed on some of the vocabulary. But I think that that notion, when there's so much money being becoming available, is going to be an interesting one to try to balance and keep whole, um, but keep balanced also to some of the proposals that we've seen from the administration. We heard from Josh Hanford earlier this morning about different programs that may test that. And um, uh, I just thank you for that reminder. You know that that how, how important that that phrase is in in the work that we do in uh, funding these projects. Further questions for Brian? No, thank you for sharing your thoughts, Brian. And um, oh, wait a minute, Representative Byron. I just one really brief question for you, Brian. Good to see you. Um, where did you score those eyeglass frames? I love it. <laughs> There's a Burlington shop called Eyes of the World. Oh, right there. I know it well. Okay. You might, the know the song, you might know the song where it comes from, the name Eyes of the World, I think. I, mo I most certainly do, sir. But yeah, good to see you, Brian. You too. <laughs> Any other personal questions the committee wants to ask the witness before we go? <laughs> um, all right. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Um, all right, committee, I'm gonna, I can't believe we finished at 2.30. Um, that's awesome. So um, yeah, let's call it a day. I wanna point out, Ron mentioned in the chat that the um, CDC moratorium docs are now visible. It's not a simple cut and paste or 17 pages. Um, I'm not asking David to do a compare and contrast, but I would. If you have the time to go find that, um, to go find our eviction moratorium, um, and maybe I can ask Ron uh, to try to find it, maybe and post it before the end of the day today, so that it's available. Just to just to give us all that background again. I know we ran through it with David a few weeks ago, um, and the. Um, Sugar. There was something else I was gonna, I was gonna mention about it, but I, I guess it's gone for now. And I'm halfway out the door. I'm going to New Jersey now to uh, see my daughter for the first time since October. So um, she's threatening to barbecue lamb ribs this weekend. So it's awesome. Um, and um, no, that's it. I think good. It's a really, really busy week. Thank you all. Um, we're going to have a busy week next week. I, uh, but let's keep doing good work on on seventy nine, and um, we will. We'll see you Tuesday. Um, can I Ron, just offer? You. Can I just offer to the new members of the legislature that the token session on Monday truly is token, which means it just advances the calendar. So we're not expected to be there, but it does mean that you wanna look at both everything that's on the calendar for action, but also what's on the calendar for notice becomes action by Tuesday morning. So if, if you like to do your homework, it's, it's double duty between now and Tuesday for that. 
And Tom, Tom, just, I'm so jealous. Have an incredible time with your family. My turn will come. Yes, it will. And um, it's 62 degrees down there today and it'll be mm -hmm. 70 tomorrow. So I'm not packing my lined jeans. No. Uh, <laughs>